I'm Erin Mahan, the OSD Chief Historian, and I welcome you to today's uh, DOD History Speaker Series. Um, a, a reminder uh, before we get started that this presentation is being recorded, so if you could please remove or conceal your badges and also um, turn your cell phone ringers off, Blackberries. Um, thank you. So today our speaker is Max Boot. He is currently the Gene Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow in National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and a contributing ed editor to the Weekly Standard and the Los Angeles Times. Before joining CFR, Mr. Boot worked as a writer and an editor for both the Wall Street Journal and the Christian Science Monitor. He has also served as an advisor to U.S. commanders in Iraq and Afghanistan and as a foreign policy advisor to John McCain and Mitt Romney's presidential campaigns. Mr. Boot is the author of three books, including The Savage Wars of Peace, Small Wars and the Rise of American Power, published in 2003, War Made New, Technology, Warfare, and the Course of History, 1500 to Today, published in 2006, and most recently, Invisible Armies, an Epic History of Guerrilla Warfare from Ancient Times to the Present, published this year. Um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce you then to Max Boot. Thank you very much. It's uh, a privilege and an honor uh, to be here with all of you. Now, I know that's what speakers always say, but in this case, it's really true. I mean, this is, this is uh, such an impressive audience of those who have been on the front lines and those who have been supporting the frontline fighters for a number of years. And before I launch into the, into the meat of my talk, let me just say thank you for all you've done to keep our nation safe. Because as we know, our enemies have not gone away. They are still trying to do active harm to us every day. And it's really the efforts of, of those in this room and so many others who are keeping us safe. So again, thank you. And you know, this book really grew out of my, the opportunity that I had to uh, travel to places like Iraq and Afghanistan over the course of the last decade and observe the wars that were being fought, observe the campaigns that so many of you were waging uh, downrange. And it really sparked my interest in trying to figure out what was new and what was not so new about the kind of wars that we've been seeing. And that's what led me to embark on this six year historical odyssey whose conclusion brings me here today. And I, it's a delight to be able to talk about some of my findings. You know, when I tell people that I've been working on a history of guerrilla warfare, the first question I normally get asked is, what was the first guerrilla war? Well, that turns out to be a question which is surprisingly difficult to answer because, in fact, guerrilla warfare is as old as mankind. Tribal warfare is essentially guerrilla warfare. I mean, think about it. Tribes don't have a command and control structure. They don't have a logistics service. They don't wear uniforms and they don't engage in the kind of toe-to-toe -to -toe frontal battle which has been said to characterize the Western way of war since at least the days of the Greek hoplites. They prefer to use the elements of stealth and surprise to ambush and to raid, making stealthy forays into the territory of a neighboring tribe and making their escape if they can before the warriors of the other tribe can make their appearance. These are the characteristics both of ancient tribal warfare and of modern guerrilla warfare. By contrast, conventional warfare is a relatively recent invention because by definition, you can't have a conventional army unless you've got a state to support it. Somebody to provide the logistics, the tax base, the bureaucracy, the uniforms, everything you need to make a conventional military force. And none of that existed up until about 5,000 years ago. The first states only arose around 3000 BC in Mesopotamia, and with them, the first conventional armies. But even once you had the rise of the first conventional armies, most of their adversaries were not other conventional armies. Most of their time was spent fighting rebels within and nomadic raiders without. In other words, guerrillas. What that suggests to me is that the way we think about this entire topic 
is all screwed up because we talk about irregular warfare, unconventional conflict, as if there's something wrong with it, as if this is not the way you're supposed to fight. But in fact, this is the way mankind has always fought. And especially today, when conventional warfare has all but disappeared from this planet. This is obviously an extremely knowledgeable audience, so let me throw out a trivia question to you. What was the last conventional war that the world has seen? The last war pitting two uniform military forces against one another. Sir? Wow, this is an educated audience. This is, that is impressive. Normally I get audiences stumbling around trying to figure out the answer. You got it instantly. That's absolutely right. The 2008 Russian invasion of Georgia was in fact the last conventional war the world has seen. But simply to mention it is to underscore how obscure that is. And fortunately, as we know, people are dying all the time in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Myanmar, Colombia, Mexico, even in Boston. And they're not dying in conventional conflicts. They are dying in irregular wars. This should not surprise us. This is the way it has ever been. It should be, it's no anomaly that the US Armed Forces have spent so much of the last decade fighting unconventional adversaries. This has been the lot of every great military force throughout history, including the greatest force in antiquity, the Roman legions. Pretty formidable, even when not led by Russell Crowe. <laughs> now we know that despite Russell Crowe's inspired leadership, Rome ultimately did fall. And what led to the collapse of the Roman Empire? Well, Rome, much like the modern United States, was a superpower without peer. It did not have a near peer competitor. And yet, it had enemies. In fact, it was surrounded by enemies, those whom the Romans charmingly called barbarians. And who were the barbarians? They were not conventional military forces like the Roman legions. They were tribal fighters. In other words, they were essentially guerrillas. The collapse of the Roman Empire was in fact precipitated by the entry into Europe around 370 AD of the Huns, this fierce race of archers from the steppes of Eurasia, led eventually by their legendary chief, Attila. Now the Huns practiced the formal warfare which ought to sound very familiar to those of us today. Let me just give you a very short description by a fourth century Roman historian of how the Huns fought. He wrote, they are very quick in their operations of exceeding speed and fond of surprising their enemies. They suddenly disperse, then reunite, and again, after having inflicted vast loss upon the enemy, scatter themselves over the whole plain in irregular formations, always, avoiding a fort or an entrenchment. Now I would submit to you, that's a pretty good description of guerrilla warfare, whether practiced in the fifth century by the Huns or today by so many insurgent groups around the world. Now having stressed the ancient origins of guerrilla warfare, I don't mean to suggest that nothing has changed over the millennia. Obviously there have been some pretty significant changes. To my mind, the biggest changes of all are the rise of what I call the three Ps. Politics, propaganda, and public opinion. These have become monumental factors in this kind of warfare in the last couple of centuries. They were not such significant factors in the centuries before. The conflict, which I think symbolizes the break between ancient and modern, between old and new, is our very own War of Independence, which was fought, we should recall, not just with muskets and bayonets, but with political broadsides like Thomas Paine's best-selling pamphlet, Common Sense. Now when we think about the battles of the American Revolution, we tend to think about battles like Lexington and Concord, where the redcoats were very chagrined to find these Yankee rascals sniping at them from behind rocks and trees and fighting in other ways they considered to be not quite cricket. And that's true. That was a significant part of the American Revolution, especially in states like New Jersey and South Carolina, where there was not a significant 
continental army presence. But I would submit to you that the fundamental narrative that most of us have of the American Revolution, of how it turned out, is flawed. It's incomplete. The way I remember being taught about the American Revolution in school, back in the days when the American Revolution was still taught in school, <laughs> is that it ended at Yorktown in 1781, when Cornwallis surrendered approximately 8,000 regulars to General George Washington. And it's true. That was the last major battle of the American Revolution. But it did not have to be the last major battle. Even after Yorktown, the British Empire still had tens of thousands of troops in North America, tens of thousands more throughout the empire, and tens of thousands of mercenaries it could have hired from the German states. I can assure you if our forefathers had been fighting not the British Empire, but the Roman Empire, the story would not have had a happy ending. The Romans did not make it a practice to go away after a defeat or two. Almost certainly they would have come back and Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, all the other founding fathers would have been crucified, quite literally. The fact that this did not happen is because of a factor that the Romans did not have to worry about because of a phrase that did not even appear in print for the first time until that fateful year 1776. That phrase was public opinion. I would submit to you the outcome of the American Revolution was truly decided not on a battlefield in North America, but in the House of Commons in London, where on February 28 of 1782, a momentous and very close vote was held by a margin of just 234 to 215, that close the House of Commons voted to discontinue offensive operations in North America. Now this was a stinging blow to Lord North and his hardline Tory ministry. It in fact led to the downfall of Lord North and the rise of Lord Rockingham and his Whigs who were committed to a policy of conciliation with their American brethren. This was not an accident that this occurred. This was something that the rebels had been consciously plotting to bring about. That's why they did things like issuing the Declaration of Independence. They were trying to influence public opinion, and not just in North America, but also in the home country. And ultimately, they succeeded. And the fact that they succeeded is pretty momentous. In fact, it's hard to exaggerate how important this was, because here you had this great power, the superpower of its day, voluntarily deciding to stop fighting even when it had the capacity to continue making war simply because its public opinion had turned against the conflict. This was not something that happened in prior centuries. It is something that has happened in the centuries since. In fact, it's been a virtual template for how America's enemies have tried to fight us in places like Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Certainly public opinion figures pretty prominently in the work of the foremost theorist of insurgent warfare in the 20th century, Mao Zedong. Now in 1938, after the Long March, Mao holed up in a cave in northern China, writing so intently by candlelight, he didn't notice a candle burning a hole in his shoe. And what he produced was one of the classics of insurgent literature, an extended essay called On Protracted Warfare, which of course is collected in one of his little red books, which I trust all of you have on your nightstand tables and consult every single night. <laughs> now Mao was famous for writing, the people are like water and the army is like fish. He stressed the need to keep the closest possible relations with the common people. He told his troops, be courteous and polite, pay for all articles, establish the trees a safe distance from people's houses, and so forth and so on. Oh, this was not advice that Attila ever gave his Huns, okay? Their idea of public relations was impaling the public. Now, why did Mao issue these instructions? Was it because he was a soft-hearted sentimentalist, a wimpy liberal do-gooder? I don't think Mao Zedong has ever been accused of that. In fact, morally, I would argue he was probably indistinguishable from Attila the Hun. But he was also canny enough to understand 
You could not wage guerrilla warfare the same way in the 20th century as you had in the 5th century. That in the modern era, nomadic roving bands of guerrillas could not sustain themselves. To be successful in the modern era, you had to have a base area, a place where you could collect taxes, intelligence, recruits, train and organize, do everything you needed to do to overthrow an established regime. And to do that, you needed to keep on the right side of the peasants. You had to pay some respect to public opinion. Now, public opinion is even more important when it comes to terrorists, whose work was defined by the anarchists of the 19th century as propaganda by the deed. And that's still a term that applies today because terrorists are very weak militarily. They're even weaker than guerrilla groups. They have scant hope of any success in mounting attacks on a conventional military force or even a police force. All they can really do is to set off bombs that will kill civilians and thereby they hope to generate headlines and ultimately in the expectation that this will change public opinion. That's, by the way, why there was almost no terrorism prior to the second half of the 19th century. There was no way for them to get their message out before then. It really took the advent of new communications technologies like the telegraph, the high-speed printing press, and then radio, moving pictures, television, satellite television, the internet. All of these communications technologies are what has enabled terrorism to flourish because it is essentially a way of getting a message out. That's something that the foremost theorist of terrorism in recent decades certainly appreciated. Osama bin Laden went so far as to say that the media war was 90% of the whole in the waging of jihad. That's how much importance he ascribed to this line of operations.